everybody. We're going to be starting a series of sh sh uh, Shurim. Shurim with Rabbi David Levy from Johannesburg at Yeshiva College Shul. They are going to cover the Parashat Shavua. We're starting today with Parashat Bo. Great. Thank you very much. Um, just for those that doesn't know me, my name is David Levy. I live in Glenazel, Johannesburg. I'm speaking from Yeshiva College, Shu. The series of the Shorim that been uh, implemented by our friend Les Glassman is going to be about Parashat Shavua. Every week, Bezrat Hashem will try and do, and also we try to bring one more Shorim in Mishnah and Masechet Avot, the Ethics of the Father. Close to the Yom Tov, we'll do more Shorim that applicable uh, to the Yom Tov. We're going to do also one more series, a special series about the Kaddish, Shorim about the Kaddish. Be'ezrat Hashem, Na'aseh V'Natzliya. We start Parashat Bo. <coughs> the Parsha starts like this. Vayomer Adonai El Moshe, Bo El Paro, Ki Ani Echbadeti Et Libo, Ve'et Lev Avadam, Lema'an Shiti Ototai Ele Bekirbo. Hashem said to Moses, Come to Pharaoh, for I have his heart and the heart of his servants. Stubborn so that I can put these signs of mine in his midst. And so that you may relate in the ears of your son and your son's son that I have made a mockery of Egypt and my signs that are placed among them and you may know that I am Hashem. Okay. The beginning of Parashat Bo starts with a commentary of Rabbi Yaakov Baal Aturim. Rabbi Yaakov Baal Aturim says, if you take the word Bo, Bet Aleph, the gematria of Bet and Aleph, Bet is two, Aleph is one, together it's equally to three. Rabbi Yaakov Baal Aturim say here, HaKadosh Baruch Hu hinted to Moshe Rabbeinu that there is another three plagues that he planning to bring on Egypt before he gonna redeem the Jewish people from Egypt. But still, there is a question that the Mefarshim ask, how come that it say Bo el Paro, come to Paro, it should say, go to Pharaoh, not come to Pharaoh. So there's few opinions about it. We're gonna bring three other opinions. Number one is Rabbeinu Behaye. We're gonna bring the Gaon Mikutsak. Also, why is it say Bo el Paro and not Lech el Paro? And then we're gonna bring another opinion of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai that bring the opinion in his book in the Zohar. So we start with the Gaon Mikutsak. The Gaon Mikutsak say the main reason that it say Bo and doesn't say Lech el Paro, that when you say to someone Lech, it means go. That means go away, Has Shalom. And you can't say to Moshe, go away from Akadosh Baruch Hu. What the Gaon Mikutsak meant to say that it's not a nice way to say to someone, go away from the present of Akadosh Baruch Hu. Rabbeinu Behaye, Say a completely different idea. He said, what is come boil power? That we see that with the ten plagues that HaKadosh Baruch Hu brought on the Egyptian, every third plague was without a warning. The first one, the first plague and the second plague was with a warning. As it says, it yatsev lifne paro. That HaKadosh Baruch Hu said to Pharaoh, it yatsev lifne paro. And also it say, Lech el Paro, go to Pharaoh. But when it's come the third plague that was, in our case here, that it was, we coming towards Makat, now we're going to have Arbe and then Hoshech. So as we see that Makat Kinim, Makat Shein, and the plagues of darkness, that mean the plagues of life, Shein is boiled, that we see that those three plagues that HaKadosh Baruch Hu brought on the Egyptian, every third plague was always without a warning. So Rabbeinu Behaye say from here that Boel Paro, that that was always when was a warning. But when not a warning, when was no warning, it didn't say Bo. The Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai Ask the question, as we mentioned, that we're going to bring a commentary of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai from the Zohar, and he says something completely different. 
What it mean boil paro? To come to Pharaoh, not everyone can just barge in and walk and see Pharaoh. We all know that the palace of Pharaoh was completely surrounded by guards. Besides guards was full of witchcrafting that no one can just walk in. And the Mefarshim say that a person that wanted to enter to Pharaoh wasn't so simple. You have to go through a lot of stages until he saw Pharaoh. Here it said, Boel Paro, Akadosh Baruch Hu actually say, Come, I'll bring you into Pharaoh, inside the palace, you and your brother. Aaron, I'm going to bring you both. To who? Inside the palace of Pharaoh, without his thing. As it's mentioned in the Zohar, the word of the Zohar, actually it's different. It say that I'm going to bring you betoch hadre hadarim. That means amongst the room, inside the rooms. And the letters of the way that the Zohar translate that, he said tanin gadol. That they call tanin gadol, it means that there is few different explanations for the word. It's a big snake, a big alligator. There's all different way that you can call it Tanin Gadol. There's other way that they call it beside alligator. It's a big um, Tanin. Tanin is uh, not alligator. I forgot. Welcome to me. Huh? A crocodile. That's it. That's it. Shakua. So a big crocodile. So from here we see that Akadosh Baruch Hu wanted to bring Moshe Rabbeinu against all the wishes of Paro and his God to be inside, to give him the message that he's going to get the plagues, number eight, that that's going to be Makat Arbe, and that we're going to speak about it. So here we see three different explanations. Why does it say boil paro? And we brought also the gematria that here, HaKadosh Baruch Hu hinting to Moshe Rabbeinu that will be another three plagues before HaKadosh Baruch Hu will do the final redemption for Bnei Israel and Egypt. We go to chapter 10, verse 6. We're going to skip a few psukim. And chapter 6, it's actually a pasuk that we can learn a lot from it. Umal'u batecha, ubate kol avadecha, ubate kol mitzrayim, asher lo ra'u avotecha, ve'avot avotecha, miyom yotam ala adama, ad ayom hazeh, vayifen vayitze me'im paro. They will fill your houses the houses of all your servants and the houses of all Egypt, such as your fathers and your grandfathers have not seen from the day they came onto the earth until this day. And he turned and left Pharaoh's presence. Okay. I would like to refer to the last pasuk that he turned and he left the prison, the house of Pharaoh. What does it come to tell us? We have to understand why the Torah have to tell us that Moshe suddenly decide to turn and to walk away from the present of Pharaoh. We see that before, if you look carefully, it was a negotiation between Pharaoh and Moshe. Do that, don't do that, I allowed you to do certain things. Here, there is no negotiation. The Torah tell us, the Holy Torah tell us that, we have to learn to understand why, it's not for nothing. But, if we look at the beginning of the Pasuk, what does it say at the beginning? The Pasuk tells us, Umal'u Batecha, that means referring first to the whose house? The house of Pharaoh. That the locust is going to come first to the house of Lo Pharaoh. Then, Ubatekol Avadecha, it's going to, after he comes to your house, he's going to start penetrating the house of your servant. That means the people that work with you, the people that with you in the parliament. And then, after that, Ubatekol Mitzrayim all the rest of the houses of all the Egyptians in Egypt. And then, he tell us that it will cover the entire land of Egypt, like those days that your father never saw before. Not only your father, your fourth father never saw like this. So here we see a miracle. Akadosh Baruch Hu actually given us a promise that the locust, where is it going to start? It's not going to start just on Egypt. It's going to start on a palace of Pharaoh. Then Pharaoh, it will move only to the house of the advisor. So we see another miracle before even the plague started. Akadosh given us, a, sorry, Akadosh Baruch Hu given a promise that the locusts will start only at Pharaoh's house, then his advisors, and then to the entire Egyptian house, and then to the entire land. 
Let's go to the, the first question that we ask. We ask, how come that here was no negotiation between Pharaoh and Moshe Rabbeinu? So the Torah tells us, if we look carefully at the beginning of the parsha in verse 1, what does it say there? Akadosh Baruch Hu said to Moshe Rabbeinu, Ve'ani, sorry, Ani echbadeti et libo. That means, Ki ani echbadeti et libo. I'm going to make the heart of Pharaoh hard. What does it mean hard? Here Akadosh Baruch Hu tells Moshe Rabbeinu, Don't waste your time. Don't waste even one word. Don't speak to him. I'm going to make sure that he's not going to listen to you. Therefore, Moshe Rabbeinu passed the message. Kadosh Baruch Hu asked him to pass the message. Moshe Rabbeinu is Moshe Rabbeinu, doesn't do nothing that is not supposed to be done. If Kadosh Baruch Hu say pass the message, he's obligated. He gone to Pharaoh, him and his brother Aaron. They pass the message to Pharaoh and they leave without any asking. So now when we read that Pasuk and it says, Vayifen Vayitse Me'in Me'in Paro, that means that he given the message, passed the message to Pharaoh and immediately left because he knew that there is nothing to negotiate with Pharaoh. We go to verse, chapter 10, verse 9, just few to keep ahead. And here there is a question Pharaoh asks, okay, I'm going to allow you to go, there's no problem. But who's the going? Who are you going with? And Moshe answered. Let's go to the verse. And it says like this. Vayomer Moshe, bin'arenu, ubiskenenu nilech, bebanenu, ubibnotenu, betsonenu, ubibkarenu nilech, kihag Adonai lanu. Moses said, with our youngsters and with our elders shall we go, with our sons and with our daughters, with our flock and with our cattle shall we go. Because, because it is a festival of Hashem for us. Okay. Moshe Rabbeinu say, answered for all, we're going to go with our youths, with our elderly, okay, then we go with our son, then we go with our daughters, and only in the end, we're going to go with our flocks, the sheep, only then, not before. But to understand that, why did Moshe answer him like this? Because Pharaoh, we know that Pharaoh was a big astrologist. He wasn't stupid. He saw in astrology that the entire generation that's going to leave Egypt from the age of 20 to the age of 60 going to die in Bamidbar, except two people. And who they are? So the Mepharshim said that it was Kalev ben Yefuneh and Yeshua ben Nun. So how do we know that that's what's referring, that refer Pharaoh to Moshe? Rabbi Yaakov Baal Aturim say, if you take the word mi vami, that Pharaoh asks in verse 8, he asks him, mi vami aolchim, who and who's the going? Why did he say, who's the one that's going? Mi vami, twice, mi vami. He say, if you take that word and you do the gematria of them, it will show you that it's equivalent, equivalent sorry, to Kalev and Binun. From here we see that from the entire people that been redeemed from Egypt, only people that enter Eret Israel was two, Kalev ben Yefune and Yeshua Binun. All the rest of the people that left Egypt that was over the age of 20 until the age of 60 die and a wanderers and Bamidba. But still, there is a question here. Moshe said to Pharaoh, Bin Arenu, first with our child, with our youngsters, and then with the elderly. But in the end, what did he say? Betsonenu bibkarenu, with our flocks, with our sheep. That's the last one that he said. So the Mephash inform here we learn that Moshe Rabbeinu would come to teach us something very important. That he knew that Pharaoh was willing to allow, and as we see later on in verse 11, Pharaoh was allowed for the elderly to go, but the youngster he wanted. And it says in verse 11, what does it say? Lochen, lechun hagvarim, lechun hagvarim, it's referred to who? To the elderly. Ve'ivdu et Adonai. It means that the elderly can go and worship HaKadosh Baruch Hu, but the youngster you leave here. Why? 
Pharaoh knew that there is no, if the Jewish people were not going to have the youths, there is no future. Pharaoh knew that the future is the youngster. And what Moshe Rabbeinu answer him first? Bin Arenu, with the youngster. We're not going to leave the youngster. The youngster we want to go with. Because that's our future. That's the future of the Jewish people. And then he said, only after that, he said, with them, we're going to take our elderly. We're not going to leave the elderly. We're going to take our daughters and on. And only in the end, Bipkarenu. The Mefarshim say, what it means, Bipkarenu, Bitsonenu? That means that our sheep, our flock, referring to our business. It's come to teach you when you come to do something, anything in life, before you do your business, you have to make sure that you get the right education for the youngsters, because they're the future. Do you live in a city that there is enough Yiddishkeit? There is a religious school. There is a shoe. There is a mikveh for the wife. The most important thing is the youngsters, because they're the future. Without them, there is no future for Am Israel. Now, when we read this pasuk and we say, when we hear, sorry, and we read what Moshe Rabbeinu, how he answered Pharaoh, we can learn from her that the most important thing, number one is, is the future of our young generation, the youths, is that we have to make sure before we do anything in life, before we move to a business that, a, sorry, a city that's full of business, the most important thing is that there is Yiddishkeit. There is a good schooling for them that they can uplift themselves with Yiddishkeit. We'll go to verse 14. And verse 14 is speak about the plagues of the locusts. Just before we start, I would like to do a small introduction to locusts. Locusts, it's considered one of the army of Hashem. There is some certain locusts, just for general knowledge, that if you turn them, and you look at the stomach, you can see that the ot het mentioned there. Why dafka het? The Mefarshim asked. So explain het, milshon hail. Hail, it means the army. Those are the army of Akadosh Baruch Hu. That's the locust. One of the army of Akadosh Baruch Hu is the locust. And here Akadosh Baruch Hu used the plague of locust. We have to understand before we read the pasuk, before we're going to show what we can learn from the locust. Why did HaKadosh Baruch Hu decide to bring locusts on Egypt? So the Mefarshim said that the main reason is that HaKadosh Baruch Hu brought the locusts on Egypt, Dafka locusts, because the Egyptians forced the Jewish people to do fun. That means they turned the Jewish people, the Bnei Israel, they turned them to what? To become farmers. HaKadosh Baruch Hu say, you turning my own children, instead of giving them a chance to study Torah, you want to turn them to farmers? I'll teach you a lesson. Mida keneged mida, measure for measure. I'm going to send my army to destroy the entire crops that they plant to eat, and nothing going to be left from it. Okay? And it's said like this. In Pasuk 14, okay, Chapter 10, verse 14, Vayala Arbe, Al Kol Eret Mitzrayim, Vayinah, Bechol Gvul Mitzrayim, Kaved Meod, Lefanav Lo Aya Ken Arbe, Kamo Vaharav Lo Yechen. The locust swarm ascended over the entire land of Egypt, and it rested in the entire border of Egypt, very severely. Before it, there was never a locust swarm like it. And after it, there will never be its equal. Okay. We have to focus on one word. What does it say in the border of Egypt? That's the question that we have to ask ourselves. The Torah, the Holy Torah, tell us here that when the Arbe came on Egypt, it was fill up the entire land of Egypt. Nothing was there. Look what it says. That's mean that he was an entire land of Egypt. That's what we have to concentrate. Why is the Holy Torah tell us? When the locust came, it was only on the border of Egypt. The Torah wouldn't tell us if it's not necessary. When the Torah tells us something, it's always to teach us something. Our Torah 
Many people think has v'shalom that our Torah is a manual. Has v'shalom to say that. Our Torah, Rabota, is, a, is not a history book, it's a manual. It's definitely a manual. Sorry, I made a mistake. People think that our Humashim, the five book of Moses, the written Torah is kind of a storybook, a history. Has v'shalom to think like this. Our Torah is a manual. From everything we can learn, the Eretz, from every word that is written in the Torah, we can learn many things. When it says, that it's rested to the entire border of Egypt, it's come to tell us something. The Midrash tells us that during the time, during the time of the plague of locusts, it was a dispute of land between Egypt and Cush. That means that the two countries was in a dispute, which one, which land belonged to which one, and how much of the land belonged to Egypt, how much of the land belonged to Cush. And the Torah come and tell us, you know, who was the deciding factor on that war? The decide factor on that war was locusts. Why? Because we know that the plague of locusts was not allowed to leave the land of Egypt. When the locusts came into the entire land of Egypt, didn't leave one centimeter more where it's supposed to be. So when they see that the locusts didn't go on over the border, they knew that that's the border between Cush and Egypt. And that's what the Torah tells us here. Vayanah bechol gevul Mitzrayim. That the locusts have the major, the major, the sign factor that way will be the entire border between Egypt and Cush. We go to verse 17, and verse 17, we'll see that Pharaoh asked something very strange that we never saw it in any other of the plagues, and it said like this, Ve'ata sana hatati achapam ve'atiru la Adonai Eloichem ve'yaser me'alai rak et ha'mavet hazeh. And now, please forgive my sin just this time, and entreat Hashem, your God, that He remove from me only this death. Okay. Why, in all the entire plagues, the Mepharshim ask, Pharaoh never mentioned to, to Moshe that, just move for me that dead. Why? It's only locusts is the dead. So another factor for us to understand for general knowledge, that in the plagues, of locusts was only six days, not like all the other plagues that was seven days. Why is it? The Mefarshim ask. The Mefarshim tell us that the locust is one of the army, like we mentioned earlier, of Akadosh Baruch Hu. Locusts never strike on Shabbos, never worked on Shabbos. That means on the seventh day, the locusts never destroyed nothing of Egypt. That for six days you were destroying the crops the trees, the fruit, whatever they have, the entire Egypt been eaten by the locusts for six days. But on the seventh day, the locusts stopped completely. The locusts didn't done any more work. When Pharaoh saw that, he was worrying about one thing. From here we can learn how wicked was Pharaoh. Pharaoh, all he wanted, wanted one thing, that the Jewish people will never learn, and not only the Jewish people, also his people, the member of his nation, not to learn, to keep Shabbos. When he saw that the locusts striking on Shabbos, that means no more working, he was frightened that from that miracle, from that nest that HaKadosh Baruch Hu make, the entire nation of Egypt and the Jewish people suddenly will do tshuva. So that's what he said. That means, just move for me that kind of a day. That means that has v'shalom, that anyone will do tshuva. From here, the Torah come to teach us how wicked was that Pharaoh. We go to verse 19, just two verses ahead. And here the Torah tells us something very interesting about the locusts. And we'll see what Rashi tried to tell us. We're going, to exp we're going to bring Rashi, and then we're going to try to understand how the Midrash, okay, fitted with what Rashi said. It said like this, Vayafuch Adonai, ruach yam hazak me'od, vayisa et arbe, vayitkeau yam asuf, lo nishar arbe had bechol gevul mitzrayim. 
Hashem turned back a very powerful west wind, and it carried the locust swarm and hurled it towards the Sea of Reeds. Not a single locust remained within the border of Egypt. Here we see that the Holy Torah tell us that not one locust stay in the entire border of Egypt. Again, entire border. Why? Why does the Torah have to tell us that not one locust ever stay? Not like any other kind of the plagues that the Torah doesn't mention that. Rashi HaKadosh said something very interesting. Afa Meluhim. What it means, Afa Meluhim? Those that were speckled. We have to understand what Rashi said. To understand what Rashi said, we have to go to the Midrash, because the Midrash explained it. The Midrash tells us that when the Egyptians saw that the entire country got kaput, gone bankrupt, they decided, listen, we have no food, we have no crops, we have no fruit, we have no trees, we have nothing to eat. What should we do? Let's try and hunt those locusts, pickle them, and we can have a food with them. We can eat them. The Midrash tell us that they managed to do that while there was the plague on. But when the plague is finished, those that the Egyptian caught and hunt them and put them in a jar to pickle them, even those that was inside the jar disappear. That means that HaKadosh Baruch Hu make again nes betoch nes, a miracle inside a miracle. What happened? That not enough that the Arbe destroyed the entire land of Egypt. They couldn't benefit from it. That even those that they put them in a jar and they tried to eat them and to enjoy them as a pickle, even those Akadosh Baruch Hu make a miracle that they disappear. From here we see that the Egyptian never have a chance once to enjoy from nothing that Akadosh Baruch Hu brought on it, even the locusts. So that's what it says in the Pasuk. And we say, That not even one locust. Imagine, if you look at the sample of a locust, just to give you a knowledge, they done a research that every swarm of a locust is a million locusts. Can you imagine to cover the entire land of Egypt? How many millions of locusts was? And if the Holy Torah tell us that not even one left, nothing left. And that was the miracle inside the miracle. From here we see how HaKadosh Baruch Hu do midah keneged midah. And doesn't even allow the Egyptian to enjoy from his own army, the army of Hashem. We go one verse ahead. And verse 20. Uh, sorry, sorry. We're going to go now. Um, boom. No, I made a mistake. It's not one ahead. We're going to the plagues of Hoshech. Let me just find it. Where is plague of Hoshech? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and plague of Hoshech, it says something very interesting. We're talking about verse 21, chapter 10, verse 21. And it says like this. HaKadosh Baruch Hu said to Moshe Rabbeinu now, we're going to get to the plague of darkness. So we're not locusts. We're going now to the nine plagues. But that's plagues came without a warning like we mentioned earlier and it said like this Hashem said to Moses stretch forth your hand towards the heavens there shall be darkness upon the land of Egypt and the darkness will be tangible okay and then obviously Moshe done it our sages tell us and as the Torah mentioned also, later on in verse 22, verse 23, that was two different kinds of a plague of Hoshech. And the plague of Hoshech, it's been divided to twice. That means to two different kinds of Hoshech, two different kinds of darkness. The Mepharshim say that the first three days of Makat Hoshech was that no one can see each other. That the entire place of Goshen, Eretz Goshen, the city of Goshen, or the land of Goshen, that's the right word to say, was light. The Jewish people can see. But the Egyptian and Egypt couldn't see one each other. So the Shaila become, why did HaKadosh Baruch Hu have to bring two different kinds of darkness? 
So Abba Mefarshim explained that the first three days of Makat Hoshech was that those was amongst Bnei Israel that decide that they don't want to leave Egypt. It's better in a diaspora. Akadosh Baruch Hu said, you don't want to come back. You don't want to be redeemed. No problem. You stay in Egypt. And Akadosh Baruch Hu killed them. It's not nice to say, but many of the Bnei Israel done Makat Hoshech. Many of the Bnei Israel done Makat Hoshech. And Akadosh Baruch Hu didn't want didn't want the Egyptian to know that amongst the Makat Hoshech, Akadosh Baruch Hu killed some of Bnei Israel, quite a bit of Bnei Israel. He decided that he's going to make such a darkness that will give a chance to bury those that didn't want to be redeemed. Not to embarrass Bnei Israel. Look how Akadosh Baruch Hu have the mercy even on the wicked of the Jewish people. HaKadosh Baruch Hu fought about their honor. He didn't want to embarrass them. The Torah come to teach us here, number one, that we also should have a mercy, should have a respect, even to the wicked person. Okay? What about the second part of the darkness? And it says in verse 23, something very interesting, and it says like this, that will, uh, sorry, 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 it's not verse 23, it's verse, yeah, it's verse 23, sorry. לא ראו איש את רעהו ולא קמו איש מתחתיו שלושת ימים ולכל בני ישראל היה אור במושבותם. No man could see his brother, nor could anyone rise from his place for a three day period, but for all the children of Israel there was light in their dwellings. That was the second part of Makat Hoshech. For another three days, another three days, HaKadosh Baruch Hu make a special Hoshech that actually you can feel the Hoshech, the Midrash say, that you can feel the thickness, that people that were standing up, stood up, couldn't lie down. People that was lying down, stay lying down for three days. People that was sitting, never stood up for three days. The Mephashim asked, how come? What was behind it? Our sages tell us that we know that the, during that time, the Jewish people entered the entire houses of each Egyptian to see what treasure they had, where they're hiding the diamond, where they're hiding the jewelry, where they're hiding the high techs, whatever you want. But the Jewish people never took. After that plague, the Jewish people come, and as it says, ish, Isha, sorry, Mishchenter. That means that the Jewish people actually demand things from the Egyptian. The Jewish people knew exactly where is everything. That if the Egyptian tried to deny that he have it, the Jewish person would say, yes, I saw it. It's in your cupboard. It's underneath. Okay, it's underneath your linen. Or it's behind your, your suit, behind your garment. They knew everything. The Egyptian couldn't refuse the Jewish people. There is other opinion. Why? Why did Akadosh Baruch Hu done it? To show that the, the Egyptian, that the Jewish people could took it in the darkness. They can take it from them. There's no problem. They can steal it. But Bnei Israel, Kshirim, that means that they are holy. They're not one of those just stealing. We're not a nation that grown up on stealing. One of our mitzvah is not to steal. And here, Bnei Israel prove it to the Egyptian that we're not slave, we don't steal. Jewish people don't steal. We have a respect, we have command by HaKadosh Baruch Hu Lot Ignov. We're gonna fulfill that mitzvah, but we're gonna ask you for it. When the Egyptians saw that they have a chance to take it, if they wanted, but they didn't done it, they were so embarrassed that they give it to them. That's how the Mefarshim explained. So now you're all going to ask immediately, whoa, you said earlier that only Makat Arbe was six day. Here you're talking about only six day. Yes. There's one more night that Akadosh Baruch Hu kept where? That Shveish al Pesach, that when they were standing on a bank of the Sea of Wheat, and HaKadosh Baruch Hu, on that night, 
that's called Lil Shimurim. So he kept the seven night for later on, just before we punished the Egyptian completely when he drowned them on Yamsuf, on a sea of wheat. That way was the last part of Makat Hoshech. We're going to go now, I'm going to skip quite a bit. We're going to go to verse 11. Verse 11, uh, sorry, chapter 11, verse 7. Sorry, we're going to skip a bit. So we're going to keep on time. Verse 11, sorry, chapter 11, verse 7. ולכל בני ישראל לא יחרץ כלב לשונו למאיש ועד בהמה. למען תדעו, אשר יפלה אדוני בין מצרים ובין ישראל. But against all the children of Israel, no dog shall wet its tongue against neither man nor beasts, so that you shall know that Hashem would have differentiated between Egypt and Israel. The Torah tells us that in Makat Bechorot, none of the dogs actually bark on the Jewish people. Why is it so important? Why is it so important that dogs never barked on the Jewish people? HaKadosh Baruch Hu come to teach us that again, that he make miracles, a man's miracle. And here we see something very interesting. We're going to bring also the Gemara and Baba Kama that we'll see what's so important about that, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu mentioned that no dogs actually try to bark or to make any warning to the Egyptian. We all know that the name of a dog came, that means Kelev, Kelev is a dog, came, the name for the animal being given by Adam Arishon. But why did they call a dog a Kelev in Hebrew? Why Dafka Kelev? Our sages say, Kelev shekulo lev. That means that the dog is full of heart. That means that the dog, if you become your dog, you have a full heart for you. That means he's loyal to you. And we know, for those that have dogs, that has v'shalom, if there is any danger, immediately the dog warn the owner. He start barking, he going wild, to warn the owner from danger. When the Jewish people left Egypt, the Torah tells us that not even one of these dogs barked. The Gemara in Masechet Baba Kama, page 60, page 2, tells us something very interesting. The Gemara tells us like this. Klavim bochim malach amavet balayr. If you hear a dog crying, okay, what it means crying, that means yelling, I'm translating. Malach amavet balayr, that means has v'shalom, that the danger, the dead angel is in town. Klavim tzohakim Eliyahu Anavi Balayr. But if you see the dog smiling, Eliyahu Anavi come to the city. It's come to tell you from here, the Gemara tell us that the dog can sense danger and can sense good. When the Jewish people in Makat Bechorot, HaKadosh Baruch Hu was make them ready to leave, not even one dog barked. Not to warn the Egyptian, HaKadosh Baruch Hu make beside that he show that he can kill every firstborn. HaKadosh Baruch Hu know who's the firstborn. They didn't bark. Why? Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu make a miracle among another miracle that even that they sense, they didn't bark. And they're supposed to be loyal. So from here we see that the Torah tell us, Lo yichratz kelev leshono. HaKadosh Baruch Hu show us here another miracle that usually a dog that's so loyal, even him, obey the command of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. We're going to go to chapter 12, verse 23. In verse 23, we're going to think that there is, le, if you read it, it sounds like there is a machloket, but we'll try to explain for us to understand that there is no machloket there. It says like this, ועבר אדוני לנגוף את מצרים, וראה את הדם על המשקוף ועל שתי המזוזות, ופסח אדוני על הפתח, ולא ייתן המשחית לבוא אל בתיכם לנגוף. השם will pass through to smart Egypt, and he will see the blood that is on the lintel and the door, two door posts. Hashem will pass over the entrance and He will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses to smite. Okay. 
If we read this pasuk, we can see immediately, has v'shalom, that there is maybe a dispute. Akadosh Baruch Hu gonna pass the door, the mashkov, when he see the blood on the doorpost, he not gonna enter that house. So how does it say later on, towards the end of the pasuk, velo yitena mashhit, a mashhit, it's has v'shalom, the angel of death. So there is a dispute, or it's Akadosh Baruch Hu, or it's the angel of death. How come that the Torah tell us twice? No, the Mefarshim come and tell us something very interesting. The Midrash explain. No, 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 no. Akadosh Baruch Hu, he's the one that done the plague of Makat Bechorot. That when he brought the plagues, he done it. Ani velo malach, as we say in Agada. What it mean, ani velo malach? I done it without the help of no angel. But here it said the angels. It says it's referring to the Jewish people. What is he referring? We know that every person after the age of 120, he have a day. We need to go back to, we have to give the neshama back after 120 years, please God. It's come to tell you, even those people that are not night, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu going to kill every firstborn or every elderly person amongst the Egyptian, on that night, if there is a Jewish person, one of Bnei Israel that's supposed to die, He's not going to die. Why? Because that the Egyptian wouldn't say has v'shalom, you see. HaKadosh Baruch Hu hit us, yes. But he hit also the Bnei Israel. No, so we're never going to be such a word. Here HaKadosh Baruch Hu showed that he's in control of a living. He can change the decree. All the miracle of Yetziat Mitzrayim that we mentioned twice a day, Yetziat Mitzrayim, that it's a mitzvah ta'aseh, to remember the exodus of Mitzrayim, it's to show us how HaKadosh Baruch Hu make miracle, inside miracle, to show how is he control of everything on earth, under the water, in the liquid, animals, everything that exists in the world. So here it's come to teach us that even the Jewish people that's supposed to be dying makat, Bechorot, nothing to do with the Makkah, because the Makkah was, that plague was for the Egyptian, even that HaKadosh Baruch Hu stopped. That has v'shalom to give them anything to say, listen, but also some Jewish die. No, HaKadosh Baruch Hu didn't want them to say anything. Not to give them any ground to stand or any leg to stand, has v'shalom. We're going to go to chapter 13, verse 13. Here we're going to see that towards the end of the Parsha, right towards the end of the Parsha, and chapter 13, and that I'm going to conclude. We have a strange command that HaKadosh Baruch Hu asks us to redeem the donkey, and we see why a donkey. We call Peter Hamor Tifde Base, Vimlo Tifde Varafto, Vichol Bechor Adam Bebincha Tifde. Every first issue donkey you shall redeem with a lamb or kid. If you do not redeem it, you shall axe the back of its neck, and you shall redeem every human firstborn amongst your sons. Rashi HaKadosh explained why Dafka, why Dafka, HaKadosh Baruch Hu chose the Hamor, that means that that's the donkey, from all the other animals that are not kosher. Why Dafka? It has to be a donkey. Rashi explained that we know that when the Jewish people left Egypt, the Egyptians themselves came to help them to load goods, to help them to load whatever they wanted to take from that country. That was the firstborn that helped them to load, and they was considering like Hamor. Therefore, because it's a firstborn, and we're obligated to redeem the firstborn of a donkey, that's why we redeemed it. The Mefarshim says something else. I saw another explanation, completely different. It's to teach us Derech Eretz, to teach us to be straight with HaKadosh Baruch Hu and with every human being. The Mefarshim said that the main reason that HaKadosh Baruch Hu chose a donkey, Dafka, because the donkey doesn't know how to pretend. If we take a hazard, a pig, what does it say about him? 
it says that he has split hoops, but he doesn't chew. Doesn't have, he doesn't chew his cut. So always he sits with his feet in the front to show that he's a kosher animal. He's a pretender. The same with the camel. The camel doesn't show his feet. He shows that he can chew his cut, pretend to be kosher. Here it's come to teach us Akadosh Baruch Hu chose why Dafka the donkey? Because the donkey doesn't pretend. The Torah come to teach us their Eretz, like we mentioned earlier. With that, I'm going to conclude. Akadosh Baruch Hu love people that honest. Akadosh Baruch Hu doesn't love those that pretend. Akadosh Baruch Hu doesn't want those to pretend. Akadosh Baruch Hu wants us to be honest with ourselves. And first of all, not only honest with ourselves, with Akadosh Baruch Hu, I would like to conclude by saying thank you to my friend Ivan Blumenfeld, that he's the reader, we call him the reader, the Baal Kore in English, and to Les Glassman again, that have the idea. He was the pioneer of that. And please God, that project will bring benefit to many of the Jewish of Am Israel. Hatzlach, I want to give a to thanks. Okay. Mr. Les Glassman would like to thank everyone. We'd really like to thank Rav David Levy for the tremendous amount of work, hours and hours of preparation that have gone into each year that uh, the Rav gives. You've, your shear has transformed your words into a living Torah that we can all take Musa from, we can all benefit from, and it is our wish, is Rat Hashem, that through the video presentation, people all over the world, in Israel, here, those who can't make the Shia, unfortunately, those who can, for revision, that your, your amazing gift of your Shia that we can all benefit from, it will enrich our Shabbos experience, it will enrich our knowledge of Torah, and a real living Torah. Thank you so very much. Shkua. Thank you.